talk of, of this day, our, our anchor man, Max Shine. So um, in thinking about his talk, it was from the University of Sydney. So I assume it's very early in the morning for you. Is that, is that true, Matt? But um, a legitimate criticism of neuroscience, even of a neuroscience focus on connectivity here, is that it tends to be overly corticocentric. The contributions of our final speaker of this session, Max Schein, reminds us that the dynamic adaptive functions of the brain are reliant on information that are non-cortical in origin. Max's important research and communication abilities resulted in his being selected as one of Australia's Young Tall Poppy Award winners. I will say nothing more about what a young tall puppy is, but I will leave that to Mac to elaborate on that if he chooses to. Thank you, Mac, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, young tall poppies, uh, it's uh, a tall poppy syndrome is in Australia. We don't particularly like people that stick their necks out and um, say something a little bit different from the herd. And so you'll see how well liked I am in Australia after my, my talk today. Um, so, um, can you see my screen, Susan? But it's, um, yes, now, good. Good, good, excellent. Um, so um, I was thinking to myself as um, listening to a couple of talks this morning, uh, and especially Sean's previous one, um, that there must be, you know, some kind of higher power deciding the order of the talks. But then I realized that Randy um, probably thought about this long and hard. So um, Sean has done an incredible amount of work uh, helping set up some of the kind of concepts um, that I want to I want to chat about today, um, and and in particular, I, I want to kind of um, make the point that I think we have this really great opportunity to kind of zoom out a little now um, and think about the complexity of neuroanatomy that really is more than just a, a cortex. Um, as Susan sort of nicely said in the preamble, um, for very good reasons, looking at a human brain, the cortex is very obvious. Um, when we're scanning the brain, the signal to noise ratio is much better for superficial regions. Um, and the lesion, lesions to the cortex can often have quite demonstrative impairments in function. So for good reason, we've, we've thought about the brain in a really corticocentric way. And that's not to say that every research on the basal ganglia, on the hippocampus, on the thalamus, on the brainstem, but as a whole, most of our sort of stories and theories for how the brain is supporting the emergent functions that we're interested in, have had a really corticocentric flavor. Um, and some of the work that I've been trying to do in my lab uh, is to try to think about what embracing some of the non-cortical structures of the brain, particularly ones that are really highly conserved, uh, like the thalamus and the brainstem, can, what, what that will add to the kinds of mechanisms and models that we might put together to try to understand um, the function of the brain. And so um, today I'm going to be speaking about um, a recent paper that I wrote, um, came out last year, where I really tried to um, understand some of that dizzying complexity that Sean showed you in those corticothalamic models um, that he was presenting from the, from the first principles of neuroanatomy. And there's this really great opportunity now, somebody who has absolutely no idea how to wield a pipette or how to inject a retrovirus with an optogenetic uh, signature into a gene of an animal and then train it to do something like myself can come along to a field and read papers that give the information that we so desperately need to try to join some of these dots and so this is a theoretical paper but the effort that i was trying to make was to try to integrate ideas about neuroanatomy that embrace the subcortex to try to think about how they would shape and constrain the kinds of patterns we see uh, in the cerebral cortex so um the thalamus here in green um, if we zoom into it, we often find these kinds of parcellations um, that people will put together. And so there'll be um, individual little subnuclei in, in, the, in the thalamus, which are these really central diencephalic structures um, that are uh, really sort of densely uh, enriched for gray matter um, and have some uh, interneurons within them. But really the, the main uh, inhibitory interneurons come from outside the thalamus. The reticular nucleus is the, the one that people think about often, which is this sort of shield that surrounds the thalamus. But there are also a number of other extrathalamic inhibitory sources, for example, the basal ganglia, the zona inserta, uh, the anterior pretectal nucleus, a number of structures that are keeping the, the thalamus under wraps. And you often see these different um, structures named uh, as if they're um, you know, uh, part of the same structure, but you can also think of them as sort of separate. And the reason for that is that they receive very different 
uh, inputs from different areas. So for example, the lateral geniculate nucleus will receive inputs from the retina and then project off to V1. Um, whereas the pulvinar, which is right next door, is receiving inputs from areas like the superior colliculus from the um, a much larger range of the cortical mantle that ranges up into the parietal lobes and often into the temporal lobe. And then we'll actually project into the parietal lobe and then other parts of the temporal lobe as well. And so often you'll hear the thalamus described in that way. Um, another way to think about the thalamus is it's extremely topologically central to our nervous system. So this is a, a figure from a really beautiful paper by Louis Puelas, who I, I, I personally think is one of the kind of world's best living neuroanatomists. And what Louis uh, shows you really nicely in this, um, this picture of a developing mouse brain is that the thalamus here, the diencephalon in pink, is sitting at this sort of choke point between the pallium here, which is really um, on the left-hand side, the telencephalon, which contains every single piece of cortex and striatum and pallidum, as well as the hippocampus. And just this little bit here uh, is the amygdala, which is actually just a kind of little constricted corticostriatal loop. It's been kind of pinned down by the development of the brain. But you can notice that all of the outputs that go via the, um, from, the, from the pallium to the spinal cord uh, via the brainstem, where they can actually have some effect on what we do in the world, have to go through this diencephalic bottleneck. In fact, we could probably expand that a little bit and call it a uh, the synencephalic bottleneck after Merca and think about the colliculus and the thalamus and the hypothalamus as playing this really crucial role in kind of constricting and shaping the kinds of um, activity patterns that happen in the cortex in the way that they can influence our ongoing behavior. Um, Another way to think about the thalamus is the way in which it projects to the cerebral cortex. Um, so I don't know if anyone saw Michael Lass's really great talk, uh, but he was unpacking some of the really kind of nitty gritty details of these circuits. And one of the really important things to note from a kind of uh, zoomed out perspective is that the thalamus, each of these projections that I mentioned to the cortex, they actually exist along a spectrum of different types of patterns. They're actually not all of the same kind, um, but instead have these very different types of um, connection uh, topologies that could betray different kinds of functional signatures. So in particular, in the work that, that, I, um, that I'm discussing today, I was quite influenced by um, a now deceased neuroanatomist from New Zealand, Ted Jones, who uh, literally wrote the book on the thalamus. Um, it's sitting on my bookshelf. It's this extremely thick, uh, uh, big black book about the thalamus that has like the most astounding amount of detail you could imagine about what is, a, you know, looks on the surface like a relatively simple structure. It's incredibly complex. And one of the, um, the perspectives that Ted Jones took, which I find quite influential, is that if you look down at the thalamic nuclei, these little gray matter substructures that I mentioned before in that first slide, um, if you look down within each of those nuclei, there's actually a, a blend of different types of connections from the, the uh, thalamus to the cortex. Now he labeled these the core type, which are the uh, type on the, on the right in green. And these are the sort of traditional lateral geniculate nucleus to V1 type connections that we are all taught about in, 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 um, in our early studies. So the idea here is that there's a, a region here that will project into the granular layers of the cerebral cortex. Um, in contrast, on the other end of the spectrum is what he calls the matrix type. Now these are much more diffuse. Um, the intralamina nuclei are like a really extreme version of this, of this type. And in contrast to the, the, the core type, these project diffusely and often to the supergranular regions of the cortex as well as, well as layer 5A, which, which I can chat about um, a bit later if people are interested. But the point that I, that I want to drive home here is that these are extremely different topologies. So they're projecting in a different way, i.e. precise versus um, diffuse, and to different regions of that beautiful cortical microcircuit uh, that Sean was showing you. And so the question is what's going on in, in, in this diffuse population? So the local population, um, we have a really good understanding, I think, of, of the kinds of functions that that could provide. You could think of message passing as, as a sort of a decent um, analogy to kind of get you in, into the right headspace. But the diffuse connections are, are a little bit more nebulous. Um, we, we can't really use the message passing um, analogy very well, I don't think, when the connections are one to many, because we lose that control over what the message might've been. Um, to, to make more uh, sort of progress in this area, um, a really talented postdoc in my lab, um, Eli Mueller, uh, who has a background in mean field modeling and physics, um, came along and we were chatting about what we thought were some interesting problems in, in this sort of boundary between neuroscience and modeling. And this diffuse coupling idea um, really sort of struck us. So what we did was we took a, a validated um, corticothalamic model. You could think about this as a little bit like the core loop that I showed you in green. And we wind it up with this diffuse connectivity on, on a toroidal structure to avoid boundary conditions. 
Um, and Eli's intuition was that this diffuse coupling parameter could act a little bit like temperature does uh, in, in a glass of water. So temperature is a, a control parameter here, which is gonna change the kind of order that you will see in the system. But it also does something different. It spreads out the distribution uh, of the system as well. And the way that it does that is that you can imagine that as you increase the temperature, now, if you're a really, um, a really uh, molecule that's of water that's received a little bit more temperature than the others, you're going to extend even further out onto the right side of that distribution. And, and Eli's intuition was, as we started to increase um, the, this diffuse coupling term, what you'd essentially see is this blend of different states, which we call quasi-critical, which is that you've got some uh, structures that have, have left a lower attractor to have a higher firing rate and hence can have more influence, but a lot of structures that have actually stayed um, in on the lower attractor and, and hence kind of keeping the system grounded so that it can actually move on to the next problem. So um, Eli, uh, this is cutting an extremely long story short, but there's a lot more in, in, the, in the paper if you're interested. Um, Eli was able to show that um, we could um, create a model like this that had a lot of really interesting features. Um, the one that I want to highlight today, um, because I think it's uh, it's relevant for some for the, some of the theoretical work, is that changing the diffuse coupling parameter really affected the way that the population responded to input. So if we were over on on what we call the subcritical side, which means we haven't put in very much diffuse input at all, essentially all of the um, the different neurons in our model, when stimulated with a, with a um, equivalent input, had the same decay rates. They basically all just decayed back down to zero. Um, if we went all the way to the right side of our, mo our model and, and essentially saturated the model in um, diffuse input, we essentially got something that looked akin to epilepsy. So the, the system basically, every single neuron crossed across the, to that higher attractor. But in that intermediate zone, we, did, we, did, we developed this sensitivity to the input so, or a susceptibility uh, such that we can now um, move the system around and we can almost imagine grabbing certain sub pockets of the, uh, of the network off to become in this higher uh, firing rate mode while keeping the rest of the system um, you know, uh, quiet and down in that lower firing attractor. Um, so for those of you like me who um, uh, don't have a background in physics um, and prefer um, analogies to help you along with this, one that I really like is the idea of, of an attractor landscape. Um, this is really motivated by some pioneering work by Vic Yerser, Randy McIntosh, among many others, thinking about slow flow and manifolds and thinking about the idea of, of um, describing system dynamics that are distributed through this really intuitive language of a ball rolling across a topographic landscape. And you can imagine that in our scenario, being stuck on the lower attractor, i.e. having not very much diffuse input, is a little bit like having a ball stuck in a little, um, a little uh, well over on the left-hand side. And no matter what it wants to do, no matter how much random noise that little node gets, it's just going to keep rolling back down into its attractor. But as we increase diffuse coupling, what we're essentially doing in this case is, is flattening out this attractor landscape. And you can think about this a little bit like activation energy um, in, in chemical experiments, such that now the, the, the system can actually, with stochastic noise, roll over into a new attractor. And, uh, you, but you could also see that at this case, it's not likely that all of them will roll over. In fact, most of them will stay here, but every now and again, one might roll over. And then if we flatten it even further, now they all start to roll and flatten it too much and all of a sudden we've lost our lower attractor. So in, in other words, we can think about an activated uh, circuit, quote unquote, as, as something like something that's sort of moved into a new privileged space of high firing that can hence have more influence over the network. So then that brings me back to my, uh, my anatomical um, uh, chaotic quest. Um, if you look at the thalamus um, and you think about those projections that I mentioned before to the cerebral cortex that come in these different flavors uh, of core-like, which are precise to the granule layers, and diffuse matrix-like to the supergranule layers. It turns out that there's actually um, a really uh, fascinating uh, line of evidence that shows that different subcortical structures preferentially contact and innovate those thalamic populations. So this is work by um, Kuramoto and colleagues um, in Japan. And what they essentially showed in, in, um, in rats, but they've also confirmed this in mice as well, is that the matrix thalamic nuclei, the diffusely projecting um, connections are actually receiving inputs from the basal ganglia, which is slightly counterintuitive based on the old Alexander DeLong and Strick models, which talk a little bit about thalamic cortical resonance occurring whenever the, th the uh, basal ganglia gates a particular loop. And the uh, core thalamic nuclei, particularly in the ventral uh, tier here, I should mention, are actually receiving inputs from the cerebellum, the deep cerebellum nuclei. So the question becomes, what is the importance of, of such a, uh, such a uh, topology? So um, if we then uh, dive in with our kind of uh, explorer hats on to think about what the 
circuitry of the cerebellum and the, and the basal ganglia having, um, uh, that makes them unique. I think that a really, really interesting set of principles emerges. So this is a, a beautiful figure of the, of the cerebellar circuitry that um, I, I had to really look at about 150 times before I, I finally got the logic. But I think there's a really lovely um, logic to the cerebellar circuitry um, that obviously has you know, its, its whole own field of study um, and numerous uh, Nobel prizes. So I don't want to pretend like this stuff isn't, isn't particularly well known. Um, but in, in this uh, review by um, uh, Gideo D'Angelo and colleagues, they have this really lovely figure, and I think it, it describes uh, things quite well. There are two main inputs to the cerebellum. One of the are the mossy fibers that come in and contact the granule cells, which are the most numerous cells in the whole brain. They're teeny tiny and, and distributed, but they're, they, the estimates are that they make up over 50% of the adult human brain. Uh, and the inferior olive, which is sitting down in the medulla. Um, and they're, both of those inputs, the, the, so those inputs are the climbing fibers that come up to these Purkinje cells. And the idea is that, um, or the leading hypothesis is that there's plasticity along these connections from the axons of the granule cells and the dendrites of the Purkinje cells that shape the only output of the cerebellum, which is these deep cerebellar nuclei. Now, the key insight is that these deep cerebellar nuclei are actually projecting back to these core nuclei, but they're receiving input from these layer five pyramidal neurons, these big cross layer um, output neurons of the cerebral cortex are projecting what some have hypothesized as an efferent copy to the cerebellum. And then it, um, it goes through its plasticity, its machinations to then influence the cortex via the thalamus. So what might that look like in our attractor landscape idea? So imagine here, we've got a set of attractors on the right and we've got a little circuit. Um, some layer five parameter neuron decides to burst based on some coincidence of, of feed forward and feedback input um, via the pontine nuclei that'll then spread into the granule cells which then through the plasticity of the, um, uh, the granule cells uh, parallel fibers and the Purkinje neurons will influence the deep cerebellar nuclei, which will then have the effect of um, slightly deepening uh, an attractor that the system could then move towards. Now, quite crucially, some work by um, uh, uh, Mork and colleagues from the University of Texas have actually shown that as the deep cerebellar nuclei project out to the cerebral cortex, they actually send their own little efferent copy back to the cerebellum, uh, to the cerebellar cortex. And so in other words, animals can learn sequences of inputs or they can chunk together a, a repertoire of, of responses to a, a one particular stimulus. And so you can imagine then that as this is happening, the cerebellum is able to control the almost ca canals on the attractor landscape to allow the system to kind of evolve in a particularly deterministic way, given a set of inputs. Um, I uh, go into argue in the paper, I don't have time to elaborate here, but more than happy to chat about this um, in, the, in the discussion afterwards, that this kind of an architecture is just absolutely beautifully set up to support parallel processing in the brain. The idea that a certain context should have a anticipated sensory outcome that you can then act upon, I think is an incredibly important feature of not only motor uh, performance, but also cognitive and effective function. Now, in stark contrast to the dimensionality expansion that you see in the cere cerebellum, the basal ganglia is doing something very, very different. It's actually collapsing the dimensionality quite astoundingly. So um, the, of, the, of the approximately you know, eight to, to nine um, uh, billion um, uh, neurons in your cerebral cortex, a, a sub proportion of those are projecting down into the striatum. And then via these two different pathways, uh, the direct pathway, which goes by the globus pallidus internus, which is just here, um, and the indirect pathway, which first makes a synapse in the globus pallidus externus before projecting to the internus, the basal ganglia can shape and control the outputs to the thalamus. Um, but in, in contrast to the traditional ways that we think about the basal ganglia, the cells that the basal ganglia actually contact in the globus pallidus um, are actually those matrix-like nuclei, which have a diffuse projection. So if we play our little attractor landscape game again, now let's imagine that we've got some inputs to the basal ganglia, um, what's gonna happen then is that there's gonna be some input uh, or some machination within the basal ganglia. And let's assume for now that the level of dopamine is high so that we've pr um, given preponderance to the direct pathway of the basal ganglia. Um, what that'll have the effect of doing is inhibiting the globus pallidus internus, which will then release, release the matrix thalamic nuclei from, uh, from the inhibition. But because of their diffuse projections, they're not gonna just go straight back to the region that created them, uh, that created the, the first signal, but rather diffusely projects, and I use the term diffuse um, in, um, in scare quotes because it's not a globally diffuse projection in most cases, but it's locally constrained, but it's still diffuse nonetheless. 
And the idea here is that they're going to give, they're going to flatten the attractor landscape, as I showed you before in Eli's work, that essentially gives the opportunity for multiple different populations of cells to then win the ultimate battle that controls action. And so in some cases, you could imagine that the same cell, because it was already slightly depolarized and spiking, might get even more input to its apical dendrites and then it can spike some more. So it could just be that you re-engage the circuit that you had engaged in the first place and you continue to act. But in a minority of cases, you could also imagine that a different circuit that wasn't active in the current context, but is still constrained by the, by the current um, goals, let's say of the organism becomes engaged. And I would argue that that um, kind of a feature actually buys you something really, really interesting, which is something a little bit akin to a, a biological explanation for, for free will or constrained volition. And the idea is not mine. Um, Bjorn Brems has a really beautiful paper if people are interested, uh, but Kevin Mitchell also speaks about this quite a bit. Um, and I, I believe Will in his, in his upcoming book on agency. And the idea is that if you have a value system and the ability to act in, um, probabilistically given those values, then you've got something a little bit like what we would call free will. Um, it's not exactly the same as what people often mean when they say free will, which is the ability to kind of control and stop things on a dime. That's a different type of a function. But this constrained variability, I think, is a really, really interesting idea. Um, and just to make sure that I give proper credit, it apparently goes all the way back to Epicurus, who called it the swerve. The idea is that you could swerve away from your destination, um, given the appropriate amount of variability. Um, so the last thing I'd, I wanted to talk about briefly, um, I, I, I do definitely want to leave lots of time for questions and I, I might skip some of the, um, the neuromodulatory slides. If people want to ask me, I'd be more than happy to chat about them. Um, but one of the really cool implications, I think, of, of thinking about this neural circuitry is when you zoom back out and you try to think about some of the really interesting ideas that we've heard about in, in the neuroscience literature. Um, one that was very influential in me uh, early on uh, during medical school when I started thinking about the brain and, and reading about it in detail was Dan Dennett's multiple drafts model or what he calls fame in the brain. And in Dan Dennett's model of consciousness, um, the fame in the brain really refers to the idea that the local subset of the brain that is the most active and has the most influence over the rest of the brain is essentially tantamount to what we call um, consciousness. Now, the, the idea um, has not been um, as sort of popularly received as some other ideas like IAT and global neuronal workspace, but I think there's a really interesting link here that maybe we can start to ask some, some testable questions about. And so you could imagine that if you have a really, really heavily parallel system, like the one I've drawn on, on the left, where any time the cerebral cortex um, decides to, can, um, to act in a particular way, um, it sends an efference copy to the cerebellum and then receives suggestions for how to act afterwards, that you could get um, something like parallel processing happening in the brain. But any time that parallel processing doesn't go to plan and you receive a prediction error, then something like the arousal system uh, could become more active and then increase the gain of the entire system. And the idea is that then you'd see more of this landscape flattening and more regions uh, becoming um, uh, getting pushed to that higher attractor and being a part of this higher firing rate coalition. In other words, it would promote particular coalitions of neuron, neurons to a sort of famous um, uh, uh, point where they could then have more influence over the rest of the system. And you know, I, I want to make a, a point that this is extremely you know, um, underspecified at the moment. There's far more cells uh, in, the, in the cerebral cortex, as you saw from Sean's talk, um, far more complexity in terms of the ion channels, but really just trying to sort of sketch out what a sort of high level description of the brain in, is sort of really influenced by the underlying distributed neuroanatomy might buy us in terms of thinking about testable predictions of the system. Um, oh yes, I, I had a couple other points to show you that these, there actually is some really cool um, empirical work now coming out from labs. This is Adam Hartman's lab on the left and Matthew Larkin's lab on the right, that are showing that these ideas are not just sort of speculative, um, speculative ones, but rather are things that you can actually go in with optogenetic control and actually manipulate different parts of this circuit and show that different functions, in this case on the left, precise reaching, and on the right, um, conscious awareness um, with the, uh, these layer five parameter neurons are actually associated with these different, um, these different systems. So I, I think it's an extremely exciting time um, to be you know, a, a, a neuroscientist thinking about these theoretical issues at the moment. Um, oh yes, I had to put up my picture of Dan Dennett looking grumpy at us. Um, uh, for not thinking about the brain um, in, in, in enough detail until now. Um, so um, I'll put this up as a little slide to say that I'm really interested in the neuromodulatory system. Um, and I think you can make uh, really neat links to that architecture that I was describing to you before um, about if you think in the wake brain, how these different systems will um, change this distributed circuit. You can look at the receptive distribution. I agree 100% with Sean that 
the types of receptors that sit within different parts of the circuit will have a huge influence over how the system actually instantiates the sort of rather diffuse increase in neuromodulatory tone. But you can start to think about some of the different implications of say turning up the level of acetylcholine and then changing the gain on incoming inputs to layer four um, cells, let's say, uh, by increasing the activity um, and depolarizing parvalbumin um, basket cells versus in, in, a, in a cerebellum with the serotonin, you can disinhibit a lot of the um, circuit by increasing the activity of these Lugaro cells, which are a little bit like VIP interneurons in the cortex. So I think there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff here for us to do to sort of etch out the details of how we think different neuromodulators will affect this distributed circuit and then how that might relate to different behaviors. And um, I went well over time, but I'm um, really, really um, looking forward to answering some questions. Oh, thank you, Mac. I think we have, I think we'll have good, that was actually pretty close to time. And I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. So we do have a couple that have already been put in the Q&A. And while I'll, the panel might be thinking about some questions that they may want to ask, I think we'll just go ahead. One of them is from um, Servan Safavi. And he has asked me to read the question. He says, as we were talking about earlier, it's 1 a.m. in Germany. And so he has to be quiet. But he said, thanks for your great talk. Could you elaborate a bit how quasi-critical state is different from critical state that has been introduced before by Beggs, Lenz, and others? Yeah, great question. And I, I appreciate you staying up late um, to ask it. Um, I find the concept of criticality um, uh, like too puzzling to even think about even when I'm like three coffees in in the middle of the day. So I don't know how you're asking questions about it at one in the morning. Um, so yes, uh, lots of people have done really great work on criticality uh, in neuroscience. Beggs and Plens have uh, a really um, nice idea about criticality. Um, we're also quite inspired by um, uh, Viola Priestman's work, which, which tries to sort of infer where re with respect to criticality the system could sit. But if I zoom out a little bit, the concept of criticality is this notion that you can get really, really non-linear changes in the, in the dynamics of a system, phase transitions, from really subtle changes in a control parameter. Um, intuitively, uh, for those in the audience who aren't familiar, the idea is that something like a glass of water, if you heat it up, can go from being liquid to, to gas uh, very, very quickly. So there'll be a, a point where it's all liquid and then all of a sudden it turns to gas. Or freezing, it's another example. You turn the temperature down, it's, quite, it's liquid for quite some time and then all of a sudden most of it's ice. Um, and so you get these really weird nonlinear transitions from really subtle changes in the control parameter. Um, the trouble though, when you start to think about biology is that those abrupt transitions could be powerful, but with great power comes great responsibility. Because if I now accidentally put too much of my system over the, over the critical point, I've now lost complete control of it, right? It's, it's now in this other zone that could run away to let's say an epileptic fit or could you know, make me focus too much on getting food and not notice the rustle in the bushes so that the tiger could then come over and eat me and have a nice um, midnight snack. And so uh, if you think about the sort of biology of criticality, it's this incredibly powerful, at least the way I think about it, it's this incredibly powerful set of mathematical sort of realities that the brain could lean into to try to gain some of the benefits of bringing the system into a kind of new zone that has interesting features without sort of pulling too far towards it such that you lose control of it. Um, and so the notion that we were sort of trying to get, um, get towards in that, in that paper was really kind of consistent with Viola Priestman's um, idea of, of sort of the brain being poised near criticality, but subcritical. And then the, the benefit of that approach is that you're now close enough to criticality that if you make a subtle move in that direction towards criticality, as I turn up the temperature just a little bit, now I get all these extra riches and they're non-linear riches, like an exponential curve. I just get more and more stuff, but I don't have to do it in such a way that's so risky that I take up all the criticality and I fall in uh, and then I, I lose control of the system. So um, we're, we're more, uh, we're thinking about things along those lines, but I, I don't want to pretend like it's that simple. Criticality is an incredibly uh, complicated um, set of uh, field and there's way more um, people speaking about it there. So I, I don't want to uh, oversimplify it too much. Great, thank you for that, Mac. So do you think this is also what might be happening in certain um, neuropsychiatric or neurological illnesses? Like we even know, for instance, in Parkinson's disease that people will are stable or going along for a certain period of time and then they seem to reach a point where they, where they fall off a cliff, right? Is it the same yeah. kind of criticality or is it just that they're reaching sort of the end of 
you know, that there's no more redundant systems or, you know, that's just an overall loss, right? So is it is it a true state transition or is it mm. reflective of something else, do you think? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I, I, I cut my teeth in Parkinson's uh, in my PhD and I still sort of come back to it um, from time to time and, and think about it. But I, I honestly hadn't thought about the um the abruptness of the of the of the fall off as you mentioned clinically it's a really that's a really fascinating question um you could test that um in particular ways because criticality has a number of particular signatures it's sort of a universality class which means there's certain things that go with it and so you if you could find the right way to conceptualize the parkinsonian system let's say you could track the activity of all of the substantia nigra cells the dopaminergic cells in the basal ganglia and you could ask whether or not their coordinated activity was firing in particular ways, such that it looked like it was going towards a, a, a phase transition and then dropped off. If you could ask those questions, you could test them. Now that's a, a heroic effort, I think. Um, and you also reminded me, I, I'm really glad you brought up the redundancy issue. I remember when I was at a movement disorders conference um, way back in my grad studies, um, Jose Abeso gave this beautiful talk about um, lesioning monkeys, basal, uh, 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 substantia nigra. And so they would put in these, um, these chemical agents that would de destroy some of the cells. And they essentially found that um, they had to destroy something like 80% of the neurons before they even got mild Parkinsonian symptoms. And then they would have to get even more and more. So the redundancy is like this, this inherent feature. It's like a language of neurobiology that I think we're still trying to really grapple with how to think about that, what it means. Much of our intuitions are built on linear systems and billiard balls knocking into one another. But the, these kind of systems with these weird redundancy features and scale-free organization, I think, have a different set of rules and principles that govern their interaction. And once we get a handle on those, I think we'll be able to ask much, much better questions about how the system works in that way. Great. Thank you. Our next question is uh, from uh, one of our participants, Andrea Lupi. Actually, can I, before we do that, can I just oh, sure. jump on to the oh, end of this? Randy, comment, so I want, do you want to follow up to this? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the criticality issue is, is actually um, uh, something that we've been looking at a lot recently well in terms of the, the models that Victor and I are looking at. Um, uh, one of the things that I think we tend to forget in <clears throat> complex systems that there's a multi-scale component to it as well. So you can actually have um, changes that are happening at a very micro scale that look like they're actually past criticality, they never actually cascade up because of the control parameters in the system. So there's a whole, it's complicated. It's a whole thing on signals and boundaries in terms of how these systems are organized in a multi-scale architecture that also protects the system. So if there is a, if there are critical events that are happening at one scale, they don't actually cascade through the rest of the system because awesome. of control parameters on the, on, the, on the whole thing. So it makes it more complicated to think about, but it's actually <laughs> a very important feature that allows um, local dynamics to re reorganize that will actually cascade through the rest of the system and causing a catastrophic event um, through the rest mm. of the system as well. That's been used a lot in, in other models, for example, metabolomics and actually even, even social and social models, but could be very applicable to the brain as well. That's awesome. Just, um, just to kind of follow- question, Susan, you want me to pass the baton? Can, can I say something back to Randy real quick and then it's, it's, see if that- This conversation before we move to a different idea, so. So, so Randy, as you were as you were um, chatting, then it, it kind of uh, one thing that occurred to me um, that is an interesting feature of, of neurobiology is just this like ubiquity of inhibition, right? There's all these things incredibly tonically active inhibitory interneurons that then get disinhibited, and then other ones get inhibited, and and there's this this it's this amazing sort of complex landscape of interactions for these systems, mm -hmm. but. One thing you buy with that inhibition is the ability to shut things down if they're not going well. You can have right. inhibition that's driven by the sort of general level of excitation, say it's the reticular nucleus, or you can have inhibition in the thalamus where you've got this, you know, um, autonomously oscillating globus pallidus, right? That's basically like the annoying friend that will not shut up. And because they won't shut up, you can't get anything out. And then every now and again, the, your other friend goes, hey, just shut up for a second and let my friend talk. And then you can speak, right? So yeah. there's these incredibly rich different patterns in the brain that I think could do exactly what you're speaking about, right? They can help to partition in time, but also in kind of more abstract space, the computations to allow them to come together at the right time and, and coordinate these kinds of really interesting patterns. That There's actually an really excellent paper world. from Alain de Stex that was published in PNAS, and I forgot the actual year that was done. And what they did is they looked at um, 
the functional connectivity patterns spatially of excitatory neurons and inhibitory uh, interneurons mm -hmm. and found that the spatial pattern of inhibitory interneurons actually was broader than it was for the excitatory, uh, which yeah. just kind of suggests what you're saying, right? There is this focal excitation that allows local um, computations to happen in quotes. Um, but yeah. if they get too high a level, you have this global inhibition that's, that keeps the dampening field yeah. on, does it, it cuts it from pre preventing the sort of cascade effect. Yeah, I'd love to read that if you could find it, Randy. At some I'll, point. I'll look That'd it up and see if I can push it into the chat window. Thanks. Sorry, um, I, 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 I then I, I, I said to deliver your question. Yeah. <laughs> Three people talking. Okay, we're going to move to Andrea, who's been very patient. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrea. Hi, um, thank you. So I, I just had one one comment and, and one question. And the comment is that it makes me very happy to see uh, more interest in the cerebellum in particular, um, and in the context of this, um, you know, considering the whole systems um, approach. So thank you for that. Um, and the question is, I'm, I'm a fan of, of the cartographic profile, um, the technique that you um, also developed. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about um, viewing the cartographic profile, so dynamic integration and segregation, but now in the view of this cerebellum and thalamus and basal ganglion for a tractor landscape. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, thanks, Andrea, for the kind words. Um, I, I really enjoyed a talk I saw of yours, but given that we're in the middle of um, a weird kind of COVID thing, I can't actually remember what conference it was at. Um, but um, so, uh, yes, how do I think about this stuff with the, the cartographic profile? which let's be very clear here, we um, unceremoniously borrowed from a beautiful work in 2005 um, uh, that in, in nature that, um, that, that kind of inspired the, the work. And we were just trying to apply it to um, neuroimaging to see what we could, um, what we could kind of get from, from that. So we haven't, we haven't yet been really grappling with that question in any great detail in part because I think that we need really good tasks that can bring it out. And so um, what the postdoc I mentioned before, Eli in my lab and, and I have been chatting a lot about conceptually what we, what we might imagine this, um, these different patterns, you know, the idea of a, a sort of a canal in the attractor landscape versus a local flattening might look like in terms of network topology, in terms of different tasks. Um, but and, and we've been very fortunate, I should add, to, to um, receive some really cool data sets from people that have collected them around the world. Um, but one of the things that you kind of notice um, as you're sort of thinking about this more deeply is there's such a huge gulf between under, having a thought about neural circuitry and knowing how it will show up in an observation model. Just, how the, just what the link is between layer five versus layer two versus layer three versus layer four parameter neurons and a bold signal, or whether or not you'd be able to even measure a subtle basal ganglia influence over the matrix thalamus in uh, ERP. And these are really big, hard questions that um, have meant that we haven't really wanted to stick our neck out just yet and to sort of say exactly what we think the predictions would be. And so instead we've been focusing more on the kind of internal consistency of the models and trying to think about grappling with some of those questions like I asked Sean before about the gradients that are existent within the brain um, that you know likely change the kind of computational signatures you'll see. So I don't have a great answer for you yet, but um, uh, I hope, hopefully it's enough to know that we're thinking long and hard about it and trying to work out the best way to kind of bring those um, ideas together. Thanks. I, I actually think this is a great answer because it means there's lots of exciting things to do. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, man. Randy, is your hands up from before, or do you have a new question? No, I actually had a, se a separate question. That was my, my other one was more of a uh, old man comment, and this was more of a ahead, old man it. question now, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, um, Mac, I've, I'd love the paper on the the criticality and talent, or the diffusely projecting uh, entity in the system. And one of the things I, I'm, I'm sort of grappling with. Um, two aspects, I guess. Um, and I see that Olaf is no longer on here, but um, you know, sort of this, the, the work that Olaf and Julio had done in the past, looking at sort of the configuration of the system that's optimal for complexity. Yeah. 
Um, and there is sort of that sweet spot, which you kind of showed with going between the different attractor states where you've got like single attract and you've got a subcritical state and you've got the second attractor emerging and that's kind of moving along yeah. that gradient of different connectivity profiles. Um, yeah. One of the, so that's one question is whether that's sort of consistent with that or is that sort of an instantiation, but it's from a different perspective. And then a second question actually comes, and I can't remember if you're there for Julio's talk. Uh, I couldn't make it, it was in the middle of the night, but I'm gonna watch it yeah. on. on um, I mean, you may have heard this, some of the comments that were uh, part of Julio's theories is, is basically which of the structures in the brain contribute to consciousness. Now, what you showed isn't necessarily uh, um, refuted by the idea that certain circuits may not be critical for consciousness because mm. they can do other stuff, which for example, you showed a very good video of the young man uh, or the kid playing, or, you know, I like that because it's a Canadian thing, right? Got anyway. Sweet dangles, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that's good for, for adaptation, but it may not be good for other functions. So yeah. what I'm trying to put, put, uh, is ask you to do is sort of think about how we, you would sort of integrate these different circuits that have these special properties into a single model. Um, yeah. Each of them has specific properties that I think are quite important for different kinds of functions. Um, but they have a common, uh, I think, a common architecture in the sense of, of allowing this, these subcritical landscapes to emerge. Just a question, I guess, of how broad um, uh, is the network involved that actually uh, controls these subcritical states? Yeah, um, both uh, very good questions, Randy, and I probably could chat to you for a couple hours about the, um, the, the, my responses. So to, to the first one, very inspired by, um, you know, everything that, that um, came out of the, that kind of uh, time and space of the Neurosciences Institute, um, you know, really loved Gerald Edelman's ideas about neural Darwinism and the dynamic core. And then I've, you know, followed uh, Julio and, um, and uh, uh, Carl and, and Olaf's work, you know, closely. And, and, you know, as I think many of us in the field have um, sort of working in their shadow and trying to see if there's any light left for us to work on. Um, so the complexity work I think is, is really lovely. And I think it's um, it's very mathematically elegant. And I don't want to pretend for a second that we've made contact with that, but we've definitely been inspired by this idea of being able to balance integration and segregation and specificity and generalization. I think that it's an incredibly important uh, descriptor of the algorithm that the brain is somehow instantiating. Um, in some follow-up work that it has a different type of modeling approach that is much more down in the kind of nitty gritty of the cellular not, not as detailed as Sean's work, but um, sort of maybe a halfway house between that and neural mass modeling. Um, we've been thinking a lot more about features of criticality and complexity that might emerge in these kinds of um, uh, scenarios where you see kind of nonlinear neurons that are neuromodulated and, and influenced in unique ways. Um, that's, that's work by, done by another person in my, in my lab, Brandon Munn, um, and that should be coming out shortly on BioArchive. So very keen to kind of chat about that um, at some point. And, but it does, it does look from first principles, like they're all in the kind of same space, but they, I think there'll be subtlety to it. And so I don't, I don't want to overclaim we haven't made a direct link. Um, as to your second question, I probably shouldn't comment until I've seen um, Julia's talk, talk in detail, but there is this kind of old well-known phenomena that you can lesion the cerebellum and it doesn't remove conscious awareness. Uh, whereas if you le lesion other parts of the brain, the thalamus, the basal forebrain, parts of the cortex, you lose conscious awareness. I don't have uh, I don't have anything uh, negative to say about that at all. I think that's totally spot on. But I would say that we probably would notice quite clearly subtle differences in the contents of consciousness of people that have had cerebellar lesions. They'll be able to they'll see the world in a different way. They'll interact with it in such a way that things will not suggest themselves to the, to people in particular sequences. So the hockey player that that you lesion the cerebellum now isn't going to notice when the person skates across their zone when someone's actually backpedaling and the other person's going forward. Right? The sort of subtle high dimensional things that experts do, I think, will be affected. So it's not that you're conscious per se, but changes what you could be conscious of. Um, and I, I don't think that's at all at odds with um, with the kind of you know clinical evidence or what I think Julia would probably say. I don't know if that answers your question yet. Yeah, good. Thanks. Great, thank I see, you. I see Brandon's here actually too, so he's. Oh, awesome. waiting his, we're waiting for your work. I should have said something mean about him. Yeah, he doesn't work <laughs> hard enough. Uh, no. <laughs> Okay, we have we have a couple of questions from the uh, participants now. Um, and we're going to turn it over to Mengsen Ying. Hi. Hi, Hi. Mengsen. Thanks. Hi, Mac. 
a really interesting talk. Unfortunately, I think a lot of it I didn't understand quite well because my neuroanatomy is bad. Uh, but I, I was really interested in the, uh, I think the modeling work with the alley uh, on the diffusion, um, uh, the role of diffusion in this. I was wondering that if uh, you guys attempted to, to do something uh, analytical or approach the problem from more classical pattern formation reaction diffusion system point of view that uh, so instead of thinking about maybe a, a, tra a tractor uh, as a, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is thinking more as an instability of spatial mode as, as in pattern formation problem. So the classic uh, pattern formation problem, diffusion driven instability that mm. helps create uh, spatial pattern with different spatial frequency. I just feel like this is like a really vague kind of my intuition I got from your talk. Is that would that be a more interesting approach to talk about the spatial scale, uh, the scale yeah. of spatial mode instead of a you know a particular tractor more abstractly? Yeah, no, that's a really great question, Mengzhen. Um, I don't. Uh, Eli could um, will probably um, write you an email afterwards and tell you that he thought of a whole bunch of stuff that um, that I just didn't understand when he was explaining it to me. Um, but th so this project was really a um, a really interesting tension between somebody who uh, really wants to understand the mathematics and the physics really well, which is which is Eli's background, and somebody who simply is incapable of understanding you know anything that's written in equation form until it's explained in an analogy, which is me. And so we we had this really, um, I think, in the end, a really fun sort of uh, period working together on this and, and thinking deeply about how to kind of make that contact. And in the end, I had to pull Eli back out of pure selfishness reasons. And I only won the battle because I was paying a salary um, <laughs> put to pull him back from pushing this in a much more mathematically rich direction, which I think it really could have gone because there's a lot of really beautiful, elegant maths behind neural mass modeling. Um, that can be leveraged to, to answer these kinds of questions. Um, so Eli may may well be very interested in this kind of stuff. In terms of reaction diffusion equations, I mean they're they're absolutely beautiful and um, and remarkably simple at you know at their core and yet give rise to like all this dizzy and complexity we see, right? The stripes of a tiger versus a zebra versus a leopard spots have all got these kind of unique coefficients on these simple uh, equations of interactions with positive and negative feedback. Um, so I would be you know surprised if brains hadn't worked out how to take advantage of those kind of universality classes but we haven't really um gone after any of those questions in this in this project there's some other stuff we're doing that that has a little bit of that flavor but but not it's a really good question and we should think about it more i think cool thanks thank you um okay next up we have andrew hi thanks mac for a wonderful talk um just your work has been particularly inspiring to me as a young cognitive neuroscientist. So this has been oh, great. Cool. Um, so I was thinking back to Emily Finn's talk, um, and I guess I'll talk mm. in terms of tractor landscapes instead of criticality, because I think it's harder to talk, ask this question about criticality directly. And I'm mm. wondering how much you think these kind of quasi-critical tractor landscapes are kind of set in stone largely from a, you know, neuroanatomy point of view um, and how much you think there are individual differences that contribute that might um, correlate with behavior, task performance, uh, yeah. psychology, things like that. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I, I love Emily's work. Um, I, I remember when I was at HBM in Vancouver and she was telling me about writing her own um, her own story that had this like ambiguous uh, interpretation that people could either interpret it as in a way that was psychotic or, or a bit like psychotic or a bit like um, kind of someone who's a bit more relaxed. And I just thought that was the coolest um, idea. Um, so I, yeah, I'm a big fan of the idea of a um, sort of state dependent changes. And um, I think in a lot of ways, the things that we describe as, um, you know, mental health disorders, um, can be kind of reconceptualized as kind of getting into the wrong attractors at the wrong time. Like OCD, I think, lends itself quite nicely. Every time you leave the door, you think, oh, I should go wash my hands. And you, you get stuck in this little kind of limit cycle. Um, and so you could make kind of, you know, stories about that. And you could think about, um, you know, like the aberrant salience hypothesis of, um, of schizophrenia from, you know, Kumar, 
that um, that the different kinds of stimuli that should otherwise be ignored, otherwise get propagated up to your conscious experience. You can imagine that would be something like flattening the landscape when you shouldn't, given the kind of uh, input, so like an incorrect ignition. So I think a lot of these things can be framed in that way. Um, and I'm really excited to see what, you know, people that are um, far closer to that, that space than I am um, can come up with in terms of interesting hypotheses that we can test. Um, and I guess another part of your question was, where do I see the, the sort of line being drawn between, you know, individual differences in manifolds and, and task-based differences? Um, it's, a, it's a really, really hard question. I think, you know, I, I, I don't think I was alone in finding Emily and, um, and Katarina's work quite um, kind of challenging for our preconceived notions of the idea that people doing a task were all the same, doing the same task. And so their brains ought to all look the same. And, you know, to first approximation, there should just be like a task signature. And when you really sit and think about it and grapple with it, it's, it's really a hard problem. Um, Susan brought it up before as well, just because people are doing the task doesn't mean they're doing it the same way. So there's all this really, really complex kind of um, uh, un assumptions that we've been making that have like bled into our imaging approaches that I think if we want to mature as a field, we're going to have to somehow work out how to estimate these things and um, I guess estimate them without just becoming neo-behaviorists because then we're sort of, if we do a too good a job of estimating, we've sort of removed the very thing that we're trying to understand in the center. So I, I don't have, a, I don't have, I don't want to like hedge either way. I think there'll be lots of really interesting stuff to come out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question and thank you, Mac. No, I think we're actually on the, I think we're really on the edge of, of being able to totally reframe the way that we think about neuropsychiatric diseases. I think mm. we are going to have to take very seriously these questions about state changes and local, local changes that may be happening because we know that there's no identifiable pathology, right? So it has to be a function, you know, it's going to have to be a functional disorder and we just mm. have to get back to Randy's point really think about it from this multi-scale, multi-level perspective and how things get perpetuated through these systems. So I think this is really yeah. exciting. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read a question from, uh, from Nathan Cross, who also doesn't have a microphone right now, but who also finds you inspiring, Mac. So he says, hi, Mac, great talk. Your work is inspiring. I was wondering, um, what your thoughts are regarding where the brain would lie on the spectrum of criticality when thalamocortical connectivity is significantly attenuated or disrupted like we see with sleep? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you very much, Nathan, and a great question. Um, I don't know if it'll ever, if we're ever, if we're going to get a really simple answer to this, because um, I, I wonder, partly based on some work that Brandon uh, Munn in my lab has been doing, um, whether or not there might be kind of different ways, different circuits in the brain and different kind of um, patterns that can take advantage of different aspects of criticality. Some of the aspects are things like variability, spatially, very, very, very temporally, and others are aspects that look like increased time scale. Um, this is sort of critical slowing down phenomena. And some of the modeling work that Brandon's doing that I, that I mentioned before actually looks like it kind of dissociates a couple of these um, different features and sort of strikes a trade-off between them. And so sleep looks a little bit more like, it was, and we fit these models to some data from, um, from macaque, some electrophysiology. And it looks like the sleep states, because it's the, these, these macaques are sleep staged, um, look a lot more like one form of criticality, the slowing down, whereas the sleep, the, when the macaque wakes up, it starts to move away from that critical attractor to a different type of one, which has more um, susceptibility and, and variability. And, and so this is just, you know, one data point, but it's important for us to kind of realize that criticality is a beautiful phenomena, um, sand piles and, um, you know, water changing from gas into to liquid into solid, but it need not be the case that brains kind of instantiate one particular form of criticality in all of its guises, but rather could use multiple different aspects as required to mediate adaptive dynamics. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm still really learning about this. And so I don't want to give that as a sort of demonstrative answer, but rather to say, it's a hard question and really fun. And I think empirical work will really help us to kind of scratch that out. Thank you. Randy. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to actually jump on a, a comment that you just finished with Susan and actually Mac as well. I mean, it's primarily just to do with the paper that just came out in molecular psychiatry uh, this week, I think it was. 
Um, and this kind of gets back to the structure function issue that uh, there are structural changes that happen that are related to psychiatric uh, disorders that they themselves actually don't, when, they, when the episode happens, they don't change. It's actually the function that emerges from the structure that exists. That's what, what, mm. what the manifestation of the disease is. So there's actually a precursor um, mm. that's there. That's actually how the, how the manifold essentially is constructed. And once the, the trajectory hits a certain point, all of a sudden there is this critical change and the person shows the uh, disorder, even though their the structural component of their brain has That sounds change. awesome. Um, now the paper itself, they don't, they don't quite do the detailed analysis, but at least they don't show that, at least the, what they can measure with DTI doesn't change, so. Great, thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, Susan, I, I can quickly comment on Zach's, you don't have to read it out, I can see the, the question. Okay, um, so yeah, so Zach, I, uh, Zach asked about um, dendritic integration theory from Matt Larkham and, and Yana Roo. I'm a huge fan of dendritic integration theory. Um, a lot of the work in my progress in neurobiology paper was inspired by Rennie Matthew's work and thinking about this kind of, it's such a strange cell. Like it's sitting right behind me on my, my picture from Greg Dunn, right? It's got the cell body down in layer five and then it projects all the way up into the supergranular layers. And the little stalk between the two is just full of holes, these IH channels that leak out current. And if you close those channels, now all of a sudden the feedback can actually fully influence the cell body and cause it to burst fire and do all this other crazy stuff based on calcium dynamics. And Matthew's work is, is too difficult to summarize in a, in a in short course, but they've linked this phenomena to really important features of learning, but also to conscious awareness of a stimulus uh, and also to the difference between sleep and anesthesia. So I'm a, I'm a very big fan of Matthew's work um, and thinking long and hard about how to incorporate even more of what they've found into the way that we're thinking about the system. Um, and so the implication then, yes, Zach, as you, as you asked, is that movement along the attractor landscape would be related to functionality but we don't yet have the subtlety, I think, to say which parts would be conscious and which parts would be preparatory activity for the next part and which part would be, you know, um, the system reconfiguring so that it, um, you know, shuttles the appropriate neurotransmitters back into the right compartments and which part is you anticipating something, but then not getting it and then wondering why you didn't ever end up getting the answer. There's so much stuff in the complexity of all these, these recordings. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're you know, really curious to sort of see how this stuff plays out. I think this is, a, this is to me, it's just a really great language to start having fascinating conversations that have, you know, um, let people like Michael Breakspear and Randy McIntosh and Vic Yoso talk to Olaf Spawns and Russ Poldrack and have a conversation. And that's really what I want to do at the end of the day is like buy those guys a coffee and hear what they have to say. Um, and so this, this to me is like a step in that direction. Okay, and uh, Colin. Hi, thanks. Oh, hey, Colin. This is really awkward. I'm getting feedback because I'm using two computers. Anyway, uh, great talk as always, Mac. Um, you kind of started hinting on this a little bit already, but I'm interested in your uh, perspective on what dysfunctions in these systems might be. I'm not thinking so much as lesions as sort of you know modulated dysfunctions ranging from minor to more severe dysfunctions of how uh, projections from subcortical regions can, to cortical regions and how this can affect the attractor landscape and what the, what the implications of that might be. Uh, and I'm kind of coming at thinking about psychosis where the sort of cortical centric theories have largely seemed to not really pan out very well, but cortical thalamical mm. striatal loops look like they might be a very good uh, potential mechanism for some psychotic uh, symptoms and behavior that we observe, um, as well as a lot of neuromodulatory theories around dopamine and other systems that have been, you know, up and down in their, their their sort of you know acceptance and prevalence, but seem to be still pretty persistent in the field. So just curious to see how you feel. What do you think the consequences of it might be uh, for for various ranges of disruption in these systems? Not as much in the perspective of a lesion, but like dysfunction. Yeah, um, it's a great question, Colin, and um, nice to see you. I guess or like the the words Colin Hawko on my screen. Um, uh, so yeah, look, I um, I. Uh, very, very consciously after doing a 10-week um, stint on the acute um, female mental, uh, mental health ward at Concord Hospital as a resident, uh, consciously decided that psychiatry was far too hard of a problem for me to tackle. Um, and so I, I only dabble very indirectly with um, kind of theoretical ideas on, on psychiatry. Um, someone like Michael Breakspear, um, who I collaborate with, would, would have, um, I think, a lot of uh, really kind of clever things to say about, about this with respect to the kind of 
attract a landscape idea and in respect with respect to sort of neuromodulating the brain and, and aberrantly versus um, adaptively neuromodulating the brain. Um, and I think, you know, th this, that's the kind of world that I don't really want to speculate on too much just because I'm uh, like a, you know, a child in that area. I don't, I don't really have a great um, uh, handle on, on that literature. Um, but more than happy to kind of, you know, um, shoot the breeze sometime and, and kind of uh, be a soundboard for ideas and, and see if any of them stick. Sure. Thank you. Well, with that, we have arrived at the, whatever time it is, wherever you are, 6.30 where I am. <laughs> this has been an absolutely, I'm sure everyone feels the same. I'm speaking for everyone. This has been an absolutely fantastic afternoon, evening, 